Glory to Jesus Christ. Hello again. Here to present to you another response video not one that I was necessarily planning on doing but I stumbled upon this clip by Jeff Durbin of Apologia Studios from a series that they are doing titled is Protestantism heresy and this particular portion was attempting to deal with the question of the Eucharist and Eucharistic theology now, I've been familiar with Jeff Durbin for many, many years. He was a huge inspiration for me with his anti-abortion ministry. They have saved so many precious babies with that ministry, and glory to God for that. He absolutely walks the walk in that regard, and he and his church have done incredible work for mothers in crisis pregnancies and just just taking children in that were unwanted. I, I have the utmost respect and for them in all of those matters. Also, I want to make very clear how much I respect uh, Mr. Durbin's zeal for the faith that he possesses. I, I keep wanting to call him Jeff. You know, I just feel like I know him, but out of respect, I will refer to him as Mr. Durbin in this presentation. But I would love to get to know you, Mr. Durbin, personally, and have a conversation with you one day if you happen to stumble upon this response video and feel like it's something worth engaging. Just know that that offer is on the table. At any rate, clearly, he feels very passionately about his faith. He desires to convert people. He's out actively evangelizing. He's ministering to his community. I guess what I'm trying to say is that regardless of the critique that I am about to present and regardless of the fact that I do not believe that objectively Mr. Durbin possesses the true Christian faith, I'm not judging him personally. And in fact, everything that I've ever seen publicly, he's always keeping his cool, even in heated debates. He's answering people with grace. At the end of the day, he just seems like an admirable person that I would like to have in the church, <laughs> selfishly. I want to be linking arms with him in the true faith, in the true church, leading people to Christ and union with Christ in the truth, worshiping God together in spirit and truth. That's what I desire. And while this video may never reach his eyes or his ears, I just want to make it clear that he is also in view as someone who personally I would just love to see embrace holy orthodoxy. And I know so many people respect him respect you, Mr. Durbin. You could be such a massive force for exposing a whole new portion of the population to the ancient and authentic Christian faith. So with that out of the way, I will not be responding right now to the longer form video that he references at the beginning of this clip. I just want to address the summary presentation here because really, I think the presuppositions at play here are what really matter. Without further ado, let's get into it. Is there any professing Christian ministry out there that has <laughs> like consistent quality, production quality matched with Apologia Studios? I mean, come on. Crazy intro. It's like you're watching a movie. This is a really important one. And um, we actually fairly recently did a, a message on this at Apologia Church. If you look up uh, Dr. James White and you look him up um, through Apology of Sermons, his sermon series he did on the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist um, is, I think, uh, something that's very helpful. He went into the church history. He went into the fathers. You know, of course, also unpacked from the text itself. I think it'd be a great blessing to you guys. So if you want further resources, 
check out the more recent sermon series on the Eucharist or communion, the Lord's table uh, that was just done. But Jesus tells us to consume the Eucharist as it is truly his body, but Protestantism doesn't teach that. And it's interesting because um, the Roman Catholic position on the Eucharist, specifically the issue of transubstantiation, is something that can be clearly demonstrated to be doctrinal development over time. However, you'll look in church history and see that the, the East... If you're someone who's kind of familiar with Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism and just, you know, a student of church history in any respect, there's something right off the bat that should jump out to you here. The central objection to Protestant Eucharistic theology that he is engaging in his video and presenting here is as follows. Jesus tells us to consume the Eucharist as it is truly his body, but Protestantism doesn't teach that. Now, this objection is being framed as having come from a Roman Catholic, as this whole video series is aimed at engaging Roman Catholicism. But that being the case, Mr. Durbin immediately takes a problematic angle in responding to the objection. Rather than addressing the substance of the objection right off the bat, he begins by specifically focusing on a critique of the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. Noting this approach is important due to the fact that it obfuscates the essence of the problem that the objection is attempting to ultimately call attention to. And to be fair to Mr. Durbin here, this is an extremely poorly worded objection. I'm not sure if this was a cunningly worded hypothetical or if it was actually sourced from a real life person who phrased it this way. But regardless, as an Orthodox Christian, here's how I would have framed my objection to really cut to the heart of the matter. I would have said, the Church of the East and the West, from the time of the Apostles until the Reformation and beyond, has historically and consistently understood and taught that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Christ. Further, the reality of this belief in practice has always been understood in the necessary context of a Eucharistic liturgy presided over by a bishop or a presbyter. Not a single Protestant denomination accepts the pre-Reformation Eucharistic theology of the Eastern or Western apostolic churches in these regards, which makes any nuanced Protestant position intrinsically ahistorical in a fundamentally fatal way. Furthermore, even if, hypothetically, there was a Protestant individual or church which claimed to affirm belief in the Eucharist in the exact same way that the Orthodox Church today and throughout history has affirmed it to be, it would still prove itself to be historically irreconcilable in that the sacramentology of the pre-Reformation Church explicitly necessitates the sacramental priesthood and apostolic succession as prerequisites for a valid Eucharist. In other words, according to the pre-Reformation churches of the East and the West, neither heretics nor schismatics can have a true Eucharist that is efficacious unto salvation and especially and obviously not heretics who deny the sacramental priesthood. Thus, just as is the case with any and every potential objection that a Protestant can come up with to seek to justify their rejection of holy orthodoxy, in order for the Protestant to sustain this particular objection to Eucharistic theology, it requires that they arbitrarily redefine the church as something fundamentally different than and opposed by the dogmatic ecclesiology of the first millennium church. You heard that correctly. The doctrine of the church is not some secondary or tertiary issue that all Christians can just 
disagree about and still be Christian. There is a whole paragraph about the church in the Nicene Creed, after all. And now I don't want to hear anything about you guys saying, oh, we believe in the Nicene Creed and how it describes the church. Those words had very specific meanings to the people who wrote them. And the doctrine of the church, according to the lived experience and teaching of the people who were involved in writing that creed, is completely irreconcilable with any form of Protestantism today. In truth, ancient, authentic, and apostolic Eucharistic theology is inextricably intertwined with ancient, authentic, and apostolic ecclesiology. You cannot divorce one from the other. However, you'll look in church history and see that the, the Eastern Orthodox is also raising their finger up saying, uh, excuse me, we also have problems. So even when the Eastern Orthodox talk about the real presence of Christ or Protestants talk about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist or the Roman Catholics talk about the real presence of Christ, there are differences and disagreements among these and, it's, and even Eastern Orthodox looking over at Rome saying, we don't accept that position. Rome's position on transubstantiation is something. <clears throat> so this is kind of a slick move here. And now I know that the goal here is to engage with Roman Catholicism. But what you'll see as the video progresses is that Mr. Durbin is kind of oscillating between unanimous, universal beliefs and practices and conflating them with these post-schism developments in the Roman church. And he never takes care to differentiate the two. He just kind of blurs them all into one and frames it in a way that all of the fundamental Eucharistic theology of the Roman Catholic church can be attributed to these post-schism innovations over time. And as you can easily find out for yourself, the doctrine of transubstantiation as it was articulated ultimately in the Roman Catholic Church really took form and developed between the 13th and the 15th century. So this is long after the Great Schism when the Eastern Churches and Rome were no longer in communion with one another. In a way, he's kind of correct in that we did not define the transubstantiation in the way that the Roman Catholic Church explicated it. We would use historically the word transmutation. And in principle, it might mean something very similar. It's just we never felt the need to, as Orthodox, go deeper in trying to explain the mystery of the Holy Eucharist in these rational categories. But what he just did there, as you can see, is he, he, he fundamentally does the exact same thing that Martin Luther did when he used the existence of the Orthodox Church and the Eastern Apostolic Churches to bolster his polemics against the papacy and its teaching. But as you'll see, after the Orthodox Church kind of serves his polemical purpose in the same way that it did for Luther, they kind of just forget about it and pretend like it doesn't exist for the rest of the presentation. All the while, in essence, rejecting also the Orthodox doctrine of the Eucharist by conflating it with post-schism Roman innovations that the Orthodox had no part in and wouldn't necessarily accept. It's kind of convoluted, honestly, but we'll parse through this. I just wanted to point this out because it's very interesting to me that he's aware of the Orthodox Church, obviously. He's willing to appeal to the Orthodox Church and its historic perspective to refute Roman Catholic post-schism novelties and innovations, but then... What of the Eucharistic theology of the first millennium church? We're just going to not engage that? We're just going to lump all of that in with these post-schism innovations so that we can justify our Protestant theology of the Eucharist as merely a symbol and a remembrance ceremony as just an ordinance? Let's hear more of what he has to say. 
Education is something that actually developed over time. Even in the Fathers, where you see people talking about Christ truly present in the Supper, uh, Protestants will say, yeah, totally agree with that. Christ is truly present in the Supper. My goodness. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I don't even... Okay. He just... This is, see, I, this is what I call the James White treatment of the fathers. <laughs> and I don't mean any disrespect by that, but I was introduced to the fathers first by Dr. James White through listening to his Dividing Line podcast, religiously, pun intended, for you know a couple years back in the day. And when he would speak about the fathers, it was usually in an attempt to quote mine them while polemicizing the papacy or some other kind of Catholic doctrine. I never really got a full holistic treatment on the fathers as it pertained to the fuller, broader reality of their perspectives relative to those subjects, right? So he would quote mine the early fathers in debates and presentations that would seem to oppose the papacy as it was later defined. But he would never go into the general ecclesiology of the church fathers, which was totally irreconcilable with his Protestant perspective on the church, his ecclesiology. So it was very selective what he would present, and it never painted the full picture that would ultimately threaten his Protestant theological paradigm. This is exactly what Mr. Durbin is doing here. Whether it's intentional, I can't say. I'm not going to attempt to judge him in that regard. But to actually make the case that the Protestants, that he, anyway, believes in the real presence of Christ, just as the church fathers did, is absolutely wild. It's beyond unreasonable. The church fathers, many of whom he would quote to support that perspective, were clergy in the hierarchical, institutional, divine, human, visible institution of the apostolic church, rooted in apostolic succession in the episcopate. These were people celebrating, again, Eucharistic liturgies, who believed that the Eucharist was for the remission of sins and for purification and illumination and sanctification. To just broadly make such a careless statement like that is extremely dangerous because people cling to that stuff and they don't ever, I mean, I went years just taking people's word for what the fathers said and taught rather than reading them myself. And it would be very helpful if he were to maybe direct people to certain fathers, but they never, they never really want you to read the fathers because if you read the fathers yourself on any given subject, you're never going to come away Protestant if you're objective. So there's really no incentive to get you to go do that kind of digging for yourself. It's always going to be this kind of selective presentation. It doesn't mean transubstantiation. It doesn't mean you're actually consuming uh, human flesh, actual human flesh and blood, the actual human flesh and blood of Jesus. So again, he just, he just did it there. You have to really pay attention here to catch this. So he says, what the fathers taught doesn't mean transubstantiation, right? Okay, well, maybe that's true, right? Because again, the transubstantiation is a later developed doctrine and articulation of the Roman church, post-schism. But he then conflates the transubstantiation with believing that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Jesus. Honestly, I think he's doing this unintentionally. I don't think he realizes that he's doing this. The first millennium church absolutely believed that the Eucharist was Jesus' body and blood. That's not just the transubstantiation. To conflate the two paints the picture that believing that the Eucharist is truly Jesus' flesh and blood 
is also some kind of doctrinal development throughout history, later history even. That is absolutely not the case. The early church believed this. They may not have called it the transubstantiation, and they may not have articulated that belief in the way that Rome later did after they were separated, from our perspective, from the Church of Christ. But let's not get this twisted here. Believing that the Eucharist is Jesus' body and blood is not a doctrinal development over time. This is the very clear and unanimous teaching and understanding of the church of the first millennium, without question. Uh, Scripture would condemn the practice of eating other human beings, um, and uh, Roman Catholicism teaches that you're eating his literal flesh and blood, transubstantiation. Roman Catholicism teaches that you're literally eating his flesh and blood, transubstantiation. He doesn't realize it. I mean, there's no reason here to assume ill intent or malice or, you know, deceptively leading people astray. I genuinely think he doesn't get it. Again, for the purpose of total clarity here, you can believe that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, without believing and accepting the doctrine of the transubstantiation. In point of fact, that's exactly how you could describe the belief of the first millennium church as it pertains to the subject. Truly the body and blood of Christ, no articulation of the transubstantiation. But more importantly, Protestants would reject what Rome is teaching on the mass, that the mass is a propitiatory sacrifice, that when you go to the mass, this is something that is cleansing your sins. And if you miss this, you're missing the cleansing of your sins. You're no longer righteous. You've got stains and everything else. You've got to deal with those sins because Jesus, of course, is not really finished. This is just Roman Catholicism. Their perspective on the mass is that what's taking place is essentially a re-sacrificing of Jesus. Now, they don't like to use that language because they say it's the same sacrifice that occurred on the cross being represented and all the rest. But it's 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 a sacri- it's that sacrifice for sin, a current sacrifice for sin. You are committing sins. You must go to mass where the priest is is an altar Christus. <laughs> I have to stop it here. It's the same problem consistently. The Roman concept of the mass is fundamentally in that respect no different than the Orthodox understanding of the divine liturgy. And the same thing goes for our understanding of the Eucharist as it is for the remission of sins. That attending the divine liturgy offers us participation in the sacraments, which, again, are for the remission of sins. There's, this is not a later development. I, I, don't, I don't know how many times I have to hammer this home, but he keeps repeating the same error here in conflating these things. And this is why I said in the beginning that it's so interesting to me that certain people have the self-awareness to reference orthodoxy in the Orthodox Church when it suits them, but then completely lack the self-awareness to understand that what they're polemicizing isn't just Roman Catholicism in many regards. It's the teaching and belief of the entire first millennium church. Christus, he's another Christ, and there's that presentation of the actual flesh and blood of Jesus. You're receiving that to cleanse any sins that you committed that week. Uh, and if you miss that, you're in trouble because now you have new sins to deal with with God. You don't really have peace with God. You don't really have forgiveness of sins where your your sins are not remembered anymore. As in- Okay, so again... He continues, and he's just describing what the entire church believed about the sacraments, about the Eucharist, prior to the Great Schism, long before the Protestant Reformation. And what he's doing towards the end there is just throwing out these little buzz phrases that they're very powerful. People are extremely attached to them emotionally. I can say that because I once was. The idea that You have peace with God once and for all, that you are saved, period, no question. Whether you adhere to the Reformed doctrine of perseverance of the saints or some form of once saved, always saved, you know, uh, 
essentially that, you know, you can't even sin will your way out of salvation. <laughs> Whatever the undergirding theology is of this idea for a given person, these kinds of statements are extremely tempting for them. It's almost like like they're saying like <laughs> just just remember what what they're real what these Catholics are really saying is that you can never know that you're saved and and you're abandoning the gospel. That's what they're getting at. That the Catholic teaching about the Eucharist and about the sacraments and about the mass or the divine liturgy is an abandonment of the gospel. And once you abandon the gospel, pff, you're done. That that's how it's being presented, right? He's not saying it in that much of an emotionally gripping way, but just speaking these phrases and planting those seeds messes with people. And again, I'm not saying he's doing that intentionally. I'm just saying that's objectively what it does. As in Romans chapter four, you are not actually counted righteous apart from your works as Romans chapter four says. You've gotta sort of get on this wheel, right? Like God's done something, but you gotta cooperate and you gotta get into the sacramental system of Rome. You gotta deal with these sacramental system things so that you actually continue to maintain that righteousness so that you're... Okay, apparently this is the theme. It's not gonna get any better. He says, the sacramental system of Rome my brother, it's not a Roman thing to believe in the sacraments. It's not a Roman thing to believe in a sacramental priesthood or sacramental confession and absolution or the Eucharist as a sacrament. These are first millennium church things. So the conflation here has got to stop. It's extremely confusing for people and that's why I'm really making this video is to just point out how common this is. Even amongst top tier Protestant apologists who are brilliant in their own right, honestly. I, I've seen him handle himself in debates just wonderfully. It's just that they're missing this somehow. Whether it's a spiritual veil or it's just genuine ignorance, I, I, I can't say and I, I have no desire to speculate. But the danger in making this mistake over and over again and really framing your perspective in a way that conveys some kind of false reality that if you can properly and effectively refute post-schism Roman Catholicism, you've also refuted the first millennium Christian witness of the church, that doesn't follow but they don't even engage that. It's like they don't even realize that their criticisms of what they think are Roman Catholic developments are actually criticisms of the early church. And in many cases, the unanimous witness and understanding and teaching of the early church, such as ecclesiology and, again, Eucharistic theology, sacramentology the sacramental priesthood. And I guess it pained me to hear this when I was watching it because I just feel like, okay, somehow he doesn't know, but like someone's got to tell the people watching this stuff, like what he's doing here and why it's so, so wrong and is so dangerous and paints just a totally false picture so that you're still okay with God. But if you miss these things, you've got sins to deal with now. It's not really finished. There's the issue of purgatory. So when Christians are rejecting the Eucharist as told by Rome, um, we're rejecting on, on purely theological grounds in terms of what is the inspired revelation of God say. Okay, throws in purgatory. It just never ends. He's now conflating the belief that the Eucharist is truly the flesh and blood of Christ with a belief in purgatory. And he's conflating a belief in purgatory with the belief in the sacraments. And he's conflating a belief in purgatory with sacramental soteriology. And he's just like mashing them all together as if he doesn't realize that there's a church that still exists and still believes and practices the faith that Rome and the Orthodox shared for the first thousand years of church history, give or take. 
The First Millennium Church believed in the Eucharist as a sacrament, didn't teach purgatory, at least not explicitly. Again, purgatory, transubstantiation, post-schism doctrinal developments in the Roman Church specifically. Those developments have no bearing on the reality that the early church prior to that unanimously understood certain things in certain ways. Those unanimous, consistent, authoritative teachings and beliefs of the first millennium church are what Protestants really have to deal with at the end of the day. Refuting these later ideas of the Latin church in the West doesn't even engage what really matters. It's actually like a kind of a red herring. Protestantism has fatal flaws that need to be addressed that have to do with the irreconcilable nature of its theology and practice with the first millennium church from the first century onward. And St. Ignatius of Antioch makes many of those problems abundantly clear when it comes to ecclesiology about the Eucharist. And in John chapter six, what you find is actually one of my favorite sections of scripture, one of my very favorite, the place that I go the most, to be honest with you, um, uh, for, for joy and happiness and an anchor. Well, if you read John six, it's a, it's a pretty substantial chapter. Jesus starts in John chapter six, verse 22, talking about the fact that he is the bread of life. So the text goes on, and in verse 26 of chapter 6, it says this, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, but not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. And then they say, What must we do to be doing the works of God? So what do we have to do? What, what do we have to do, Jesus? Tell me what I have to do to work the works of God. Listen to the simplicity of the gospel that Jesus preaches here. He says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So what do we have to do? What, what, what do we have to do here? Okay, what do we have to labor? How do we have to do this? And Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Faith, trust in Jesus. This is another this is another one of those classic lines that really tug at the heartstrings of Protestants. This particular understanding of the gospel is perceived to be everything, right? Like it's where they source their hope and their strength in many regards. If it were true, if it made sense, it'd be nice and easy, wouldn't it? It's 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 appealing. But here's the thing. We can't have this reductionist perspective of the gospel. Right? We can't just say that this one sentence is the gospel, is representative of the fullness of the gospel. And maybe he's not intending to say that explicitly, but he really kind of is saying that, right? It's like, oh, we don't need all these sacraments, right? We don't need this, that, and the other thing. We don't need, I'm sure he would say, we don't need this institutional hierarchical church or to go to confession and be absolved by a successor of the apostles whatever it might be any perceived work right that could potentially earn salvation of course that's not how we look at it or understand it that's just how they would characterize their understanding of our teaching and theology but the point is when he sits there and says it's just that simple you know like the work is to believe. Okay, well, how he's presenting that, what he's presenting that to mean is a little bit disingenuous in my opinion because I think he's smart enough to realize that you would not say a Christian doesn't need to attend a local body, right? You would not say that a Christian doesn't need to get baptized. So even you, and, and there's many, many, many more things that I think he and anyone would understand is implicit in following Jesus in an authentic way. So even Mr. Durbin doesn't really believe in the ability to 
reduce the gospel to just this like one sentence because normatively every christian who follows who decides to believe in and follow jesus from his perspective would need to do certain things or else they would reveal themselves not to be faithful followers of jesus so you can't divorce the gospel even in his perspective and faith from attending a local church whatever that might be for him or from participating in communion however frequently and whatever that might mean to him or from living a life of virtue in this respect or that respect he might not have a quota in mind right and all of these things are kind of like up for grabs as far as how to define them since there's no normative authority that can bind the consciences of the faithful to anything in this regard in his paradigm but he still believes that they're there right that they're part of the picture and you can't just lop them off and reduce it to just believe as simple as that sounds and although some people may only have that opportunity say at the end of their life that still doesn't mean we can just reduce the gospel purely to that as if there's no intrinsic responsibilities that come with true faith. Which is really all that we're saying. One of the intrinsic responsibilities of believing in Jesus and desiring to follow him is to enjoin yourself to his body, the church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the church that he established through his apostles and their successors to participate in the life of the church, to partake of the holy mysteries and the uncreated energies that are made available to us, communion with God, that we would participate in the life of God and be progressively saved. The problem is he can't say that what we're believing is wrong because it can't be reduced to this simple sentence as the gospel, when in reality, Neither can his, if we're being honest about it. Now, I'm not going to play the rest of the video because, quite frankly, I've already addressed what I believe the fundamental issues here with his perspective are. And essentially what he does for the remainder of the video is he starts going through particular passages of scripture, ultimately in an attempt to justify, support, and prove his understanding of the Eucharist as a Protestant in opposition to the Roman Catholic and Orthodox and unanimous understanding of the church through the first millennium. And honestly, I just don't feel like it it's, needs to be addressed because again, all heretics throughout history have appealed to the scriptures as a means to justify their heresy. And many of them made very compelling arguments at times. And I will be the first one to admit that when I was a Protestant, these scriptural arguments supporting the Protestant understanding of the Eucharist, not that it's monolithic, but I guess just in opposition to the historic understanding of the first millennium church, they were very compelling. They were logically coherent. But just because you have a logically coherent argument from the scriptures alone doesn't mean that your conclusions are true. If your presuppositions are out of whack or false, right? If you're operating on a false presupposition, your conclusions can be false even if the logic that you're using within that framework, that epistemic framework, is coherent and reasonable. Right? If your epistemic framework is false, then your conclusions can be false even if your logic is on point. So for me, it always kind of made sense that the Eucharist was just a remembrance ceremony, right? That it was something our Lord told us to do, so we do it out of obedience, and it's got a spiritual benefit, and that he's spiritually present somehow, but it's definitely not what the Catholics believe the Orthodox. <laughs> what I found later when I started confronting these subjects in the history of the church was that it really doesn't matter how good of an argument I have from the scriptures 
if my conclusions are ultimately opposed by the unanimous understanding and teaching of the church of the first millennium on any given subject. Like at that point, you just have to kind of humble yourself and say, I'm not that smart, I'm obviously wrong, or I am very smart, but I just realized that I was operating on this false presupposition. And the false presupposition is sola scriptura. I already have a whole video on that subject. It's called Fatal Epistemology and the Evisceration of Protestantism. So if you really want to dive down that rabbit hole, I suggest you go watch that video because it's critically important when it comes to understanding why Protestantism as a paradigm, no matter what the nuance, is completely untenable. So with all due respect, I'm not really interested in hearing scriptural arguments that lead to the conclusion that's opposed by the unanimous witness of history prior to the Reformation. It's just not something that I find worthy of engaging, not because anyone's not intelligent or not sincere. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense to embrace a conclusion, no matter how good you think your argument is, that opposes that reality of history. So I, I just don't find it compelling at all. So to close this out, in conclusion, I hope that I have effectively communicated here what the issues with Mr. Durbin's perspective on sacramentology is, particularly the Eucharist, and why his constant conflations here are painting a very confusing and erroneous picture that doesn't actually engage the issue with Protestant Eucharistic theology issue being that it's irreconcilable with the reality of history and I hope it was done in a way that was digestible for you the viewer Mr. Durbin or if I can call you Jeff I would love to talk sometime however if that's not God's will yet you do stumble upon this for whatever reason I pray that it finds you well Please, sincerely, I ask that you forgive me if anything that I've said here has been found to be offensive or particularly harsh. That is not my intention. I would love to bridge the gap of understanding between us somehow, whether that's through personal dialogue or conversations that are sparked as a result of this video in your sphere of influence. At any rate, may our Lord continue to bless and guide you and reward you for your zealous activities, saving and rescuing those who are being taken away to slaughter in those abortion mills. Truly incredible. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen.